day of oral argument for this panel, which has been very enjoyable. And uh, we welcome you to the Fifth Circuit. I assume you're familiar with our lighting system. Um, when the yellow light goes on, you should get nervous. And then when the red light goes, goes on, you should get really nervous and stop talking. Uh, just bad joke. Um, OK, uh, we are delighted and looking forward to hearing your argument. Uh, we will call. We had two cases on our docket this morning, actually three. We'll hear two live, and then we'll take a break and hear one by Zoom, uh, the third case. So we will call, let's see here, we'll call the first case, number 21-40712, United States of America versus uh, Mohammed Pathé Ba. Mr. Illich. Good morning. Judge Duncan, members of the panel, and may it please the court. My name is Niles Illich, and I represent the appellant, Muhammad Ba. This appeal presents a single question, and that question is whether the district court did enough to adequately explain the two dramatic variances it imposed. For us, the answer is no. We concede, as we must, that the error was not preserved, and so we're before the court this morning on plain error review. We do believe, however, that this is one of the rare cases that can meet this unusually high standard, and we'll explain that in a moment. But I think it's useful to begin with a reminder of where we started, and that is with the guidelines. And the guidelines range for count one was 53, 51 to 63 months. For guidelines two, for count two, it was a minimum of 120 months for a total of 183 months. The government asked for 600 months, and the district court imposed a sentence of life, which I've quantified at 900 months. I don't know if there's an official month quantification for that, but that's 75 years, followed by 300 months for a total of 1,200 months. So we've gone from 187 months to 1,200 months, an increase of more than six and a half times. The failure in this case isn't necessarily the imposition of the 1,200 months. It's the failure to explain adequately why they imposed 1,200 months. And I'll tell the court what it already knows, but it is procedural error to fail to adequately explain a sentence. And the further you get from the presumptively reasonable guidelines range, the more explanation is required. This is not new law. This is law that has been before this court and before the Supreme Court uh, for decades. But here, when we look at the record, whether it's the statement of reasons form that was marked in section six, or whether it was the exchange during sentencing, we simply don't know why the sentence is what it is. Now, I think this really requires me to turn to the plain error analysis because that's where the meat of this case is. And as the court is aware, there are really four things or three things here. Error that's clear and plain that um, affected the substantial rights and then, of course, the exercise of discretion. I think the easiest of these for my client is to show error. Uh, and, and to show that it was clear and plain on the record. And that is because cases like Gall from the Supreme Court, Bostick, Smith, uh, out of this court, have been very clear that if you're going to impose a sentence, the district court doesn't have to do the guidelines, of course, it can go up, but if you're going to go up, you need to explain it. And you explain the 3553A factors, like nearly every district judge in this circuit does. Here, we simply don't have that explanation. The remind judge, me, counsel, um, uh, remind me, counsel, what did the district judge say, if anything? Uh, yes, Judge Duncan, he gave the same answer, the same explanation for count one and count two, and that is something along the lines of uh, under the 3553A factors and the history and, and circumstances of the defendant, I'm imposing this sentence. Right. And, and in your view, that's just not enough explanation. I mean, uh, I, I, admittedly, it's some, it's thin. Yes, Judge Duncan, I, I, I don't think it's enough. And maybe if we were talking about a guideline sentence, mm -hmm. I think you could get there. But as we deviate six and a half times, if my 900 months is a fair number, 
But if we deviate six and a half times from the presumptively reasonable guidelines range, there needs to be some explanation. And, uh, you know, when we look... It strikes you that when I look at this, as a, <clears throat> it's precisely the reason we, we, had, we enforced the plain error rule. They, uh, they, it, to reinforce the obligation to advise the court. Because that's the, a, the objection made at the time, the judge would have promptly given you the explanation you wanted. Uh, so why, I, I have trouble escaping the, the plain error. Uh, Judge Higginbotham, I understand that, and it's hard for me. If I, I, and I'm just in a moment of candor here that's usually not a good idea. Uh, I really looked for other issues because I didn't want to bring up a plain error issue because I recognized the problem. But that really, in my mind, goes to the fourth prong of the plain error analysis and whether this court should exercise its discretion. And typically when this court exercises its discretion and finds plain error, it's looking to something that sort of goes to the fundamental fairness, the integrity of the court system. I think, let me just interrupt you for a second because there is a third prong. Right? Yes, Judge. Let's assume okay. it's error. Let's assume it's plain. Okay. Now, it is your burden to show that the plain error affects the defendant's substantial rights. In our case, I'm looking at Mondrian Santiago. Um, you have to show, the defendant has to show that it affected the outcome of the district court. You have to show that um, a probability sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome. Now, how do you do that in a case sure. like that? And Judge Higginbotham, if I may come back to your point when I, when I address the fourth prong. Closely related. Though. Yeah, that, I, I was trying to just, I wasn't trying to preempt Judge Higginbotham. I just think that that's all. <laughs> I just want to make sure I get everybody addressed. And certainly, Judge Duncan, I think prong three is the hardest prong for us because, you know, I would, it's an alluring argument, it's a seductive argument for me to say that Look, anybody who would look to this long mental health history, I think, would find it mitigating. But I cannot point to a place in the record that shows that kind of error. So in some of the cases we've had errors where they marked a guideline sentence and then they imposed an above a guideline sentence. There you could do it. Here I cannot go to a place in the record and show you that. And that's I mean, what I appreciate it. It's a, it's a, you're right. I mean, I look, I was an appellate attorney. It's hard to make a plain error argument, and I appreciate the candor. Uh, this is an unusual case. The uh, the variance or departure, whichever one it is, is is dramatic. Um, and, and yet, it, it it is clear, is it not, or maybe it's not. The district court was aware of the mental health issues, right? Judge Duncan, I will say that we know so little that I think we should say the district court should have been aware. I don't think we can say with absolute certainty that the district court was aware. It's in the PSR, right? It's in the PSR, and the court, of course, says it read the PSR. It did say that. Yes, yes, in the, in the form of reasons, it says that. But if I can go on just a little bit on prong three, and I'm not sure that I elaborated on this as well as I could have, but when I cited to the Cron case, Right. John case. Uh, what I'm explaining to the court there is this idea that the affecting of substantial rights and 3553A uh, section, I think it's C, really goes to the ability to do an effective appellate review of the sentence. And part of the showing of um, the effect of, on appellate substantial rights is that without some explanation, we don't really know how this sentence came. So we look at his, let's look at his uh, criminal history, okay? He's got assault on a police officer that he got one point for, and then he's got like failure to drive with a driver, a speeding ticket or something, a, a seat belt on. Let's say the judge imposed a 900 month sentence because he had a, he had a ticket for driving without a seat belt on. I would come to this court and say that's substantively unreasonable. The judge district court may believe that shows irresponsibility and that, um, and that irresponsible people need longer sentences, but we don't give 900 month sentences as enhancements usually for failing to wear a seat belt. So the court really is prevented from doing an effective appellate review of this sentence by failing to explain by the district court's failure to explain why it varied so highly. And I mean, that, I guess the elephant in the room is the shooting the bank teller in the head, right? Of course, Judge so. Duncan. And, and I have not shied away, and I don't shy away, 
from that fact and i'm not saying that my client is innocent i'm not saying that he doesn't deserve to go to prison i think we start with the idea that the sentence and guidelines are presumptively reasonable which put it at what 183 months which is i think almost 16 years now is 16 years an appropriate sentence for somebody who gets shoot somebody else in the head and there's no argument that the guidelines were improperly calculated correct correct judge inglehart no one has made that argument okay my my question is other than an improper or i should say an erroneous a plainly erroneous guideline calculation are there any cases that we should look at uh either controlling or persuasive uh that relate to sentencing plainly erroneous sentencings that were vacated or reversed on appeal i think phillips would be one john would be one uh bostic was not one it was not a plain error it was reversed but i think it is i mean it was preserved but i think it is a good explanation of the law and i've included it here but with full disclosure that it was preserved and we're not here but i guess i would turn the court to phillips and to uh sean but if i could turn to judge higginbotham's point uh about how hard it is to overcome plain error and the necessity and the need to encourage attorneys to make these objections contemporaneously i think it goes to sort of the public perception of the credibility of the court and when we see a sentence that is this dramatic when we see a sentence that is 1200 months that's a sentence that the public deserves to have an explanation for and whether the attorney messed up or whether the attorney he certainly did uh, and i can do this on a writ my writ is written right here um, but it goes to the credibility of the court the court should say why it's imposing 1200 months if it's because a man was shot in the head and another person had a panic attack a near heart attack and and the court believes that's an appropriate sentence fine say so but if it if it's because he had a speeding ticket or if it's because he drove without insurance that's a different matter this goes to the credibility of the court and that's been conventionally where this court has exercised its discretion but i assume that, that there has to be some coloration of of, of, of error lurking in the background somewhere uh, otherwise we're just left from the, <clears throat> the fact that this the sentence is was perfectly proper <laughs> within the range of the discretion of the district court and <clears throat> the uh, and then the plain error doctrine um, it'd be difficult to, to say that it, it affected the outcome etc so we're left with your rationale which i appreciate that uh, there is a there is an obligation that <clears throat> that is not that inherent in the imposed by these rules of the public declaration that's sort of an openness rule as, as you yeah. argued but i don't find that the latter point although i think it's it, 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 it sound in, in reality uh, in the cases but perhaps there is one is that right particular rationale uh, as being distinct in and of itself well and i i'm not sure that it is except for the fact of the magnitude of the distinction and we looked at cases like smith uh, that we cited in our brief that really talk about this imperative to explain a big variance up or downwards it's not just upwards but up or downwards when you're going away from that you need it to be explained why does it need to be explained it needs to be explained not only for the defendant but for the attorneys and for the public so that so that there isn't a party focus upon the the, 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 the uh, information uh, given to the defendant, uh, I assume that, the, uh, that, the, that we earlier in the, in the proceedings, uh, the district judge had, in, had explained that he was, <coughs> the, uh, he was adopting the, the findings of the recommendations of the PR, other, other reporters, probation. probation officer report. Uh, in other words, he, had, <coughs> he made some interrogation to, the, to counsel as to whether or not you've consulted with your client and reviewed that at us. Yes, Judge Hickenbotham. They went through the usual things, and then you, you know the admonishments, and then you have argument from the government, argument from counsel, and then two little sentences saying, um, 
explaining why and so we believe this is one of the rare instances that meets the plain air standard we appreciate the opportunity to speak with the court this morning there are no further questions we ask the court to reverse this and remand for a new sentence thank you thank you we have time for rebuttal let's see sorry uh ms alanis Good morning, and may it please the court. Amy Alanis for the United States. Um, context is everything, including in federal sentencing matters. Um, the Supreme Court in Rita made very clear that where a matter is conceptually simple and the record makes clear the district court considered the evidence, the district court does not have to give extensive reasons for its sentencing decision. So do you think, do you, do you think there's any error here at all? I would say only to the extent that you can actually separate prongs one and two. It, it, well, I mean, they're two prongs. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if we were under preserved error, yes, if, if we're only looking at error, but I don't believe this error is clear and obvious given the context here. This man walked into a bank. He didn't say a word. Within five seconds, he had pulled out a uh, 22 handgun loaded with 10 hollow point bullets and he shot the teller oh, in the I, face. Hey, I, I fully recognize that. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the difficulty here is the extent of the upward variance, which is, is. seems dramatic. It is dramatic. It's dramatic. And we have a case, I was just reading from Mondragon Santiago from 2009 that says, okay, well, if there's no explanation and it's a within guideline sentence, well, we're not gonna find, on plain error review, we're not gonna find uh, substantial rights have been affected. But this is not a within guideline sentence. Right. To the contrary. Mondrian uh, Santiago was still within the guidelines, right. so it's a little different here. But it's not just the egregious facts of the case, there are a lot of other things going on. And um, you asked defense counsel what the uh, district court actually said. For both counts, he says, count one, I am doing enough for variance. And he repeats this twice. For count one and count two, he says, pursuant to 3553A1, the nature and circumstances of the offense and the history and characteristics of the defendant, I am going to upwardly depart. And I think one thing that's really important about this case is there wasn't any serious mitigation evidence offered. Baugh himself refused to allocute. He, he did not say a word, he didn't apologize, he didn't try to you know, make excuses for himself. His defense lawyer did as well as he could, but basically he tries to float the idea that, well, my client is mentally ill. Well, that was pretty neatly um, debunked by the competency exam in which the psychiatrist examined him and found no schizophrenia, no mental illness, and no mental deficiency. And then the other thing that was offered was, well, he had nine other hollow point bullets in the gun, but he didn't hurt anyone else. I mean, that's kind of weak when, you're, when you look at what happened here. Uh, and so what is there to, ex what would there be to explain in the case? Here, this judge, who, who is a seasoned uh, district judge, he looked at this guy and he knew the whole history uh, of this case. And he just thought that even, even the prosecution's uh, recommended sentence simply wasn't enough. Uh, this is he not a case. He didn't get into that, right? Did the, did the judge explain why he thought the, the uh, I know the prosecution was asking for an upward variance. Yes. And you're saying the judge obviously didn't think that was enough because it went beyond that. Did he address that? He did not specifically he address, it. address it, but the, um, the prosecutor, he filed a written notice of intent to seek upward departure or variance. That was done even before the PSR was completed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then at sentencing, he uh, gave a very eloquent explanation. And he went into a lot of detail about why an upward variance uh, was appropriate. Yeah, no, I've got, I mean, we've got it right here. This bank robbery was a serious and vicious event, and the upward variance is necessary to protect this community that, from the individual. Yes. And I know we're all so inured to hearing terrible things in the news about violence and, you know, terrible incidents. But, you know, in federal court, uh, it doesn't happen that often that someone walks into a bank and just shoots somebody in the head. I mean, this is really an extraordinary case. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that is a huge factor, too. Um, What's your best case, um, best precedent you can point to that the explanation here was 
sufficient to the extent you're arguing that? Well, I think it's Judge Higginbotham's opinion in Fraga. Uh, that's a good one. And also key, um, uh, in Fraga, again, it was, you know, he, it relies on Rita, that language in Rita, that when it's really clear, and I mean, nobody disputes the evidence. Again, there really wasn't any serious mitigation uh, that was presented. So it was just, it wasn't clear and obvious error. And also the case key, um, where they talk about the district court in the statement of reasons can incorporate the government's motion, and that happened here too. And if I could just talk for- That's a, That seems important to me. You say key, the, the district, we, we can read the district court as incorporating, what, what did you say? Um, in the statement of reasons, um, he, he, the district court uh, specified, you know, this upward departure was made on the motion of the government, and that occurred, the, the government made that argument twice, and it's notice of intent, and also at sentencing, made a very uh, full explanation of why that was necessary. Um, there's also a case called Key, I mean, I'm sorry, that is Key, where they talk about uh, the statement of reasons. And there are a couple other minor cases, Segura, Osorio, Obundis, um, and also on the, on the third prong, um, actually a case that he relies on, I think it's actually really good for the government in this case, uh, the Chan case. Uh, Why do you think Chan is good for you? Um, well, it's a, it comes down to the, to the third prong in that case. And so, uh, again, the, the court, instead of looking at it as a first or second prong case, it looks at that statement of reasons again and say, look, you know, this is good enough. You can't show that your rights were substantially harmed because uh, the statement of reasons incorporates the government's argument, and they're all on the record. So I think those are our best cases. Okay. Counsel, if, if, we, if we wanted to agree with you but we're concerned that we were forgiving uh, district judges, giving them a very low bar to clear. Uh, what could you tell us that would make us feel a little more comfortable with the idea that this was sufficient for purposes of, of sentencing? Well, I think this is an extraordinary case. The facts are extraordinary. The defendant was extraordinary. He, he didn't even allocute, uh, he, you know, the mitigation, there's really no serious mitigation here. Um, I think you can distinguish this case, you know, as the extraordinary case it is, and not <laughs> make it clear that district judges really do need to be explaining things a little better. I mean, that's, I, I don't think anybody would say that isn't true, but I think it's distinguishable. And one, of the, one of the difficulties is our formulating rules from up here and translating to the reality of the courtroom and the sentencing dockets is difficult. Um, they, uh, because they, this is one case, and I don't know how many out of the docket, but many of these judges have, have, are, are, have 15 or 20 oh, yes. uh, cases uh, to be sentenced, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got the PSR, and it's got all that detail in it, you, we required the, the, the district judges to, to inquire and make clear on the record that this has been reviewed with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that still leaves open the, exactly what, the step up, but it, in the review of that, it, it is plain that, that this is a permissible, legally permissible sense, that, and then that's within the range itself. And what was argued to the, what, what did the defendant argue to the judge about the Senate? Um, he, even, even the defense counsel. I'm sorry? Uh, defense counsel admitted at sentencing that an upward variance was appropriate. And I, I think he asked for a total of 242 uh, months, which would have been the mandatory 10 on the firearm. And then, so that would be about 10 years on the. Uh, the, the, the colloquy then um, was about upward variance. Yes. Everyone knew there was going to be one because his, his guideline range on the armed bank robbery was only 21 to 27 months. Well, did, that, did, that, did any of that colloquy did include the range of going all the way to the max? I'm sorry? Did that, did that, that colloquy about upward departure contemplate that it would go as far as this did? Mm, I, I don't think so. I mean, he, admittedly, the judge imposed even more than the prosecution asked for. The prosecution asked for 25 on both, which would have been the max on the robbery and then 25 consecutive. So admittedly, he did not explain why he thought it was 
deserving of even more than that. So if there are no further questions, we would ask the court to affirm. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Mr. Illick, you have some time for rebuttal. Thank you, Judge Duncan. <clears throat> Very quickly, three points. First, counsel says there was no evidence of mitigation. <clears throat> and I think that's simply not true. Uh, when we look at the PSR, there's a long history of mental health problems. He's institutionalized for eight months. He's given a long-acting psychotropic drug. There is a long history. The judge, of course, didn't have to believe that. We simply don't know whether he believed it or not. The tension between the evidence of his mental health history and the finding that he wasn't actively suffering from schizophrenia when he was examined by the court-appointed psychologist is something the judge should have explained. Look, I don't buy the prior, I don't buy the prior uh, mental health issue. I think he did this, you know, as a normal, healthy human being. That's different. We need to know that. We don't need to know that. Talking about Phillips, uh, I mean, Key and Fraga, which I think, Judge Duncan, you said that was an important point to you on Key. And what I want to make sure is clear <coughs> about, about Key is that the government sentencing argument uh, discussed ex exhaustively the 3553A factors. So this idea that we're going to go up was addressed exhaustively in the government's uh, sentencing argument in key in the notice of uh, intent to move upward here it's a single page here we don't have an exhaust exhaustive discussion uh, at most it says uh, you know it should go up because of the guidelines the use of a dangerous weapon and the background characteristics it just doesn't do the exhaustive discussion that we see in we know that the defense key. counsel didn't lodge an objection. What did the defense counsel, what was the defense counsel's posture at the sentencing? What were they arguing? The arguments were, look, he suffered from mental health. I mean, this is a guy who moves from North Carolina to Harlingen and robs a bank on a gold huffy bike. You know, I mean, to me, that's almost facially some sign of mental health problems. But uh, it focused on that during the argument. It, Admittedly, I think you're right, Judge Higginbotham. There probably were 15 sentences that, small, that morning. They did maybe three or four minutes for the it's government. Rejection, it's the rejection of that, of that argument that, that uh, you say um, is, a, is, a, is the difficulty here. That is that uh, he went to the max. He rejected the, the mental difficulties and deficiencies, which are certainly uh, highly relevant. And I struggled with that, Judge Higginbotham, but I don't think, I, I ultimately concluded, I don't think we can agree that he rejected that. We just don't know why. Perhaps the sentence comes from the fact that my client had a ticket for speeding or not wearing a seatbelt. We can assume, and it would be rational to do it, to impose a sentence like this because you rejected the mental health history, but we don't know from the record that the court did reject it. And that's the essence. A, a part of the part of the of the, <clears throat> of the, of the, the court's obligation to explain uh, his discharge uh, by the frequently by just the, the nature of the argument that's made uh, defense counsel is arguing that this fellow has his poor mental history et cetera et cetera he don't know what he's doing and da, da, da. Uh, they uh, he needs treatment uh, on incarceration is not the answer et cetera and the, and then the district judge it, when he turns and gives, rejects that by the high sentence, um, then uh, that why isn't that sufficient? In other words, it's the full context of, of, sure. the, of the character. Judge Higginbotham, if we had had an explanation that he did in fact reject the mental health history, right, that the district court says, I don't agree that he, have, he had ever had mental health problems. His family was wrong to put him in mental health treatment. He never had that. Okay, fine. That would help us understand that he rejected it. Here, we simply... What I'm suggesting to you simply is that, that what, <clears throat> what do you say to the suggestion that, that it's implicit in his rejection given the argument that's made? I would say that we cannot get from A to B to C on that. I do not think we can conclude from the fact that the court imposed this large sentence that it necessarily rejected the mental health 
it may be that the court rejected that. That would make a lot of logical sense, right? But it may also be that the court imposed this sentence because my client had a, a ticket for driving without a driver's license. Now, I realize that's an extreme example, but it is to illustrate the point that we simply don't know, and I, may I finish my answer here? Yes. Uh, we simply don't know why the court did it. We don't know whether it's a rejection of mental health. We, we simply don't know, and that's why we ask this court respectfully for relief. Thank you, counsel. Uh, thank you for a well-argued case. Thank you for having Both us. Both sides, and uh, we uh, take the matter under submission. Thank you for having us. Excuse me.